This is New Cap News with Brian Lentz. Good evening and thank you for joining us. A 20-year-old Lloydminster man has been charged with second-degree murder in connection with a homicide in the border city. Deshane Taden Bird was one of two people held in custody in connection with the case. Bird will appear in court Tuesday. The other person was released with no charges. 47-year-old Shane Victor Linus was killed just after midnight on Monday. An autopsy determined the death to be a homicide. Police believe this was a targeted incident and are not looking for any other suspects. Well, rural communities continue their battle with criminals and many say few solutions are in sight. Gerard Lampel gets some insights from Marwayne. Apparently the last robbery at the liquor store, there was uh, a gun involved. No one was hurt. Chris Newritter is the deputy mayor of Marwayne, one of several small communities served by the Kitscotty Detachment. I think the only solution would be uh, more of a police presence, more officers. There's only, I think, five for the whole county of Vermilion River. Another piece of the puzzle is, is you know, successful prosecution, and that means collecting the information, collecting the evidence. Kitscotty RCMP covers some 2,500 square kilometers. This gives criminals some time before police can be on scene. New Ritter feels over the last two years, the perception is that crime, particularly break and enters, is up. Starkey says there's no quick fix. He favors successful apprehension and prosecution, as well as rehabilitation to break the cycle. But this does not deal with repeat offenders. The, the legislative side of things, if there are things that can be done in terms of a tweaking to the legislation to uh, you know, either uh, uh, require you know, uh, d different ways of handling uh, repeat criminal activity, I think those are all things that we should explore. By comparison, for the county of Vermilion River, break and enters and motor vehicle thefts are up for 2017 over 2016. Some communities like Hillmond have turned to a dedicated police officer. Would that be a strategy that Marwain might consider? Yeah, I would definitely be willing to pay a little more taxes to have something like that. Gerard Lampau, Newcap News. Well, when City Council expressed concerns last year that the Lloydminster Facilities Corporation was receiving funds without approval, they didn't expect such a large sum as revealed by the forensic audit. Now the question becomes what to do moving forward. Josh Ryan has more. It was an eye-opening session for City Council this week as the forensic audit on the Lloydminster Facilities Corporation revealed $1 million was owed to the city from 2010 to 2017. This includes more than $250,000 for utilities and a $100,000 loan for which the terms appear to be undocumented. While no instances of dishonest behavior or malfeasance were found, it represents a divergence from clear communication to Council. I definitely don't like to see any kind of non-transparent numbers coming through and also seeing that there were loans that were approved by members of the board at the time uh, that were not approved by council which you know is playing fast and loose with the bylaws. A large portion of the money owed also stems from revenues falling far short of budgeted expectations which brings up the question of whether it's a good thing to have a corporation run the golf and curling center instead of the city. I don't have an opinion one way or another. I'm waiting for the experts as it's been referred to in our operational review to give us some insight. Looking only at the $125,000 a year doesn't accurately reflect the revenue shortfall occurred primarily during economic downturn. Some years the golf course has done extremely well. The curling club was a very busy place, so it varies year to year. As disappointing as this news is, Council is focused on moving forward with more information from the upcoming operational review in order to tackle communication, inventory flaws and more. Certainly once it's happened, there's not much we can change about the past, but we can certainly influence the future and that's our intention. Really, how is it supposed to function in a more efficient and organized way so that we don't run into the issues we've got with this uh, facilities court moving forward? And for taxpayers, that the centre will operate at a known realistic cost. Maintenance is ongoing. We've uh, spent money on capital and continue to invest in it as a public recreation facility. How we operate it, stay tuned. Josh Ryan, Newcap News. The race to win the United Conservative Party candidacy has already begun in the Midwest. Garth Rosewell is the first to put his name forward. After transitioning from a farm supply business, Rosewell has worked in Lloydminster as a financial advisor for the past 15 years. As a financial advisor, I dealt with a number of my old farm clients and also oil people, so I you know, was aware of what their issues were and 
you know, and talk to them about their business. And, we, you know, as, as a financial advisor, you get pretty involved with people and, um, and uh, you gain an appreciation for what's bugging them. He says he's always been interested in policy because it has a large impact. Carbon taxes really bug me, you know, like I just think that's such a waste of effort and putting lots of harm on people. So there's things that I don't like that are being done right now that I'd like to switch around. Though no specific date has been chosen, Rosewell says the nomination process will likely begin this fall. And it is Winterfest time again in Lloydminster as the annual festivities will soon be beginning. This is the sixth year of Winterfest here in the community and along with all the classic events such as shinny, curling and hot dogs, there are some new additions as well. Indoors, we have a photo booth coming in. Um, we have the originals, the bouncy castles. We have laser tag with um, One Up Gaming, and we have archery and family activities with Wild Side Outdoors. Winterfest continues to grow each and every year in events, sponsors, and community turnout. The last few years, we've had, oh, I think around four or five thousand people show up uh, so it's this is the sixth year I believe that it's happening and uh, we always have a huge turnout. Winterfest begins on February 19th. For more information visit the Lloydminster City website. And we have two adorable orange cats up for adoption this week. McLean is a handsome feline with a special snaggle tooth. And Chubbs is a nine-year-old cat hoping to find his forever home. Here's John from the SPCA. This handsome feline is McLean. McLean also has a unique snaggle tooth that makes him really stand out. McLean is an absolute love who just adores people. All he wants to do is snuggle up next to you. And during this recent cold weather, we all could use a little bit of extra warmth. When he's not purring on your lap, McLean is on his scratching post catching a cat nap while soaking in the sun from the comforts of indoors. McLean is an absolute sweetheart that will make even the darkest day all the brighter. Be sure to stop by the SPCA and meet this adorable fellow today. At nine years old, Chubbs may be a bit older than most of the cats of the SPCA, but like fine wine, he gets better with age. Chubbs is a very low-key cat. He prefers spending his days napping or staring quietly out the window. But the minute you arrive home, he'll be the first one to greet you at the door. Chubbs is also a great listener. He'll happily sit on your lap for hours while you share your day with him. Chubbs doesn't require much, just a warm bed, food in his bowl, and a human to love him unconditionally. If you can provide those things, then Chubbs would love to meet you. Stop by the SPCA and say hi to him today. Thanks, Gerard. A recent survey from the Canadian Federation of Independent Business shows 93% of farmers surveyed say the regulatory burden on their business is growing. As Canada celebrates Agriculture Day, farmers are grappling with red tape, and the CFIB is concerned for Alberta. It shouldn't be any surprise that Alberta is at the bottom of CFIB's ratings of our red tape report card, which for the second year in a row received an F grade for failing to support any comprehensive measurement or reporting or controlling the regulatory burden. The survey was done in 2017. Some 7,800 people responded from across the country. Nearly 400 were egg producers. About 70% of farmers say red tape cuts into productivity and discourages business growth. Red tape is that alphabet soup of regulations in an agency that's costing them time and money. It's that inconsistent information, the confusing forms, rules that are outdated or just plain old rude customer service. If you look at what farmers deal with from the agencies of CRA to CFIA um, to you know, Stats Canada surveys coming out, um, at their busiest time of year. There is also a concern that red tape could stop the next generation of farmers from getting into business. The fact that 93% of farmers believe the regulatory burden is, is growing and nearly 40% of them would, uh, nearly 40% wouldn't advise their children to start a business uh, because of red tape. You know, we know that succession continues to be a major issue. The CFIB survey results were released at the end of January. This is New Cap Sports. The Rustlers women's basketball team is already ahead of its 12-12 record from a year ago, and the season still has two weeks remaining. 
According to Lance Phillips, the team may have been exposed in a recent weekend series against Augustana, but some unlikely sources are stepping up to ensure it doesn't happen again. There have been many surprises over the wrestlers' women's basketball season to date, but maybe none more pleasant than the play of the team's six rookies. Three of the newcomers started Friday in Augustana, and Saturday, four received the nod to start in a key victory at home. I knew they were going to be important for us. I did not think they were going to play this well. Uh, essentially, we have four freshmen that can play in our top eight, which is huge for us. Um, we'll still rely on our vets down the stretch and in playoffs, but to know that we can go to those freshmen and they're playing like second or third year kids is fantastic. We all give up different like things to the team. Like Kaylee's a good rebound and driver. Bailey's always on the boards. Like I'm a shooter. Jade's, just, Jade's a shooter. Drew's a shooter. Just all around, we just made the team more whole. I think so. With your rookie year, like we all go through it, and it's an up and down kind of roller coaster. But like good for them for starting because if they can be in games of starting, how much more of a threat do we become? Since a seven and zero start to the season, the wrestlers have compiled a seven and six record a stat that certainly isn't indicative of the quality of team on the court. But 144 points against versus Augustana has highlighted an area of concern that needs to be addressed. We gave up a lot of straight line penetration to the rim and a lot of threes. They're a very good offensive team, so those are things we're going to try to fix rotationally and keeping them out of the key. We knew their team was shooters and we didn't get out on all the shooters, which we should have. Um, we have to work on going over top of screens when it's shooters and just talking screens and just like crashing O boards and D boards all the time and just they got a lot of second chance opportunities, which shouldn't have happened. Despite that 7-6 and six record, everyone on the floor believes the current version of this team is better than the undefeated one seven games in. Yeah, I, th I think our depth is a lot better. Our younger players are stepping up and playing huge roles. We've played a tough skid of games with all playoff teams in this area. Of course, when you're at the top, people are going to try to catch up to you. So I think everybody is kind of making their adjustments, and now we have to take that as an opportunity to make our adjustments when it really counts now in the later end of the season. Lance Phillips, New Cap Sports, Lloyd Minster. Well, over the years, hockey has made its way onto the silver screen many times. In this week's Beyond the Boards, Eric Friesen gives us a closer look into what the Bobcats enjoy watching. Many hockey fans would argue the Bobcats are the best show in town, but players are fans of the game too so it should come as no surprise that each of them has a favorite sports movie. I gotta say my favorite one's Miracle, uh, especially when Mike Ruzioni scored that goal and the running celebration, for sure. Although the Charleston Chiefs made their theatrical debut more than four decades ago, hockey fans of all ages have an appreciation for the classic film. Yeah, I'd have to say slap shot, kind of just because you can, kind of relates to the junior, junior A lifestyle, I guess, and being on the road with the boys and having a good time. You got an old father, so me and him used to watch it all the time, so <laughs> yeah, it's a good one. I guess it would probably be slap shot. I'm, I'm an old guy, right? So I remember watching slap shot, and I, I kind of got my, my little boys into watching slap shot, and you know, it's a good comedy, a good. Uh, you know, uh, old school hockey, having some throwdowns, and I, I enjoy watching that now and then. In recent years, Goon has become one of the most popular hockey movies for its comedic scenes and non-stop fighting. While it's not Scantleberry's favorite, he believes it tops the list for a couple other guys on the team. Some of the, the grittier guys, maybe Coleman and our tough guys like that one, so yeah, for sure. Eric Friesen, New Cap Sports.